Good afternoon, everyone. As we tick round to one minute past four, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth annual probate and court of protection conference. Uh, and without doubt to our most unusual one yet, um, I won't say more about the unfortunate and unusual circumstances in which we find ourselves, uh, but nevertheless, we are all very, very grateful that you've chosen to spend some of your afternoons um, listening to us today. Um, I'm not going to say very much at the outset before we kick off with our first session, uh, but in the last year, members of 24 Oil Buildings have continued to be very active uh, in probate and other inheritance disputes, as well as in disputes in the Court of Protection uh, and indeed otherwise relating to capacity. But beyond mere court and advisory work, we've also done quite a lot of, uh, of things outside professional practice in this area. On top of lots of lectures and webinars, members do a lot of pro bono work uh, in relation to probate and inheritance disputes, principally through Advocate, for whom we had a very successful charity quiz um, in the days before the first lockdown. Um, we've been and remain very active in the newly minted Court of Protection Bar Association, and I hope also you'll have seen our new Trusts and Estates Update series, which was launched earlier this year, uh, which highlights and um, comments on particularly new or particularly interesting developments uh, that come to our attention. They've been ably put together by Tim Sherwin, and each of the speakers that I'm going to introduce this afternoon, I'm pleased to say, has produced an update for that series already. Um, that, I think, is all I intended to gas on about in general terms at the outset. So let's get straight on to the detail of the veritable smorgasbord of talks that we have lined up for you and for which you have tuned uh, in for. In terms of content, we're going to try and keep each slot pretty short and snappy in order to keep your screen based uh, attention. But we are, as ever, very, very interested in your own contributions or questions. So do please feel free to use the um, chat function on Zoom uh, to raise any questions or make any observations which will come through to me and I will make sure that our speakers are suitably grilled um, on those questions. So with that introduction out of the way, our first speaker is Matthew Watson. He, as you um, are no doubt aware, is an advocate in demand, as his website proclaims, and he's got particular experience in fairly high profile attempts by fiduciaries to limit their liability having had parts in both Investec and Glenella, and also First Tower. He is going to be talking to us about succession and body parts. And so, as you might imagine, he's very much going out on a limb. Matthew. Thank you, Ed. Uh, hopefully you can all see uh, my slides. Um, this is a bit of an unusual talk. It's all about body parts and whether you can leave them in your will uh, or, 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 or whether they have any sort of effect in probate at all. Um, I should say, if you're in any way interested in this topic, um, you should see uh, an article written by myself and by Julia Burns in the Step Journal. Uh, I think Julia Burns uh, is listening and credit has to go to her for asking such a series of interesting questions, such as, can I leave my tattoo uh, in my will? I hope in the 15 minutes I've got to provide a very short answer to that question. Um, the starting point is the classical rule. I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that there is no property in a body. It's ancient. There's Ulpian, the uh, Roman jurist, who first posited the idea that there can't be any sort of property in a human body. It's been absorbed into the common law. So as long ago as 1882, it was decided that you can't leave your body in a will because it's not property and therefore it's not capable of being disposed of. Now, since then, there have been quite a lot of inroads into that, um, into that principle, and I just want to start um, by looking at some of them. The first is what I call the detached body part cases, and these are really two cases. The first is called Dudwood and Spence, and the second is uh, the Crown and Kelly, and they both concern things like that, namely preserved body parts in jars. In Dudwood, the, uh, which is an Australian case, the question was about uh, whether someone who ran a, a circus, a travelling circus, who had all of these strange uh, ornaments when he died, whether they fell into his estate, whether they were property. In the Crown and Kelly, someone had stolen uh, artefacts uh, like this from the Hunterian Museum, which is just round the corner from Lincoln's Inn. It's the Museum of the Royal College of uh, Surgeons. And his defence was, I can't be guilty of theft because body parts are not property. Um, I should say, if you're ever in chambers for a conference, 
do take half an hour to go to the Hunterian Museum because it's very interesting and uh, very weird. Um, the analysis that came out in Dudwood was that whilst there's no property in a body, where a person has by the lawful exercise of work or skill dealt with a human body or part of a body, then it is capable of acquiring rights of property and possession. And so in Dudwood, the Australian court held that these preserved body parts in jars were capable of being property. And unsurprisingly, in the Crown and Kelly, the Court of Appeal didn't let the erstwhile thief off on the grounds that you can't steal body parts. It applied Dudwood, but there was also uh, a rather interesting comment from Lord Justice Rose, where he said or, or posited that there might be some future occasions on which human body parts might be held to be property, even without the um, the acquisition of dif different uh, different attributes, if they have some sort of use or significance beyond their mere existence. And this line of cases was developed in what I like to call the sperm cases, a series of decisions um, from the last decade. The first in England called Yearworth and North Bristol NHS Trust, which is about whether a group of men who'd um, frozen their sperm in a sperm bank that the NHS had then accidentally destroyed had a claim in conversion. And the NHS said, well, you don't own your sperm because you can't own body parts. The Court of Appeal said that was wrong that um, sperm was capable of being body parts to and capable of being property to found a claim in conversion. Uh, that case was followed in Australia by two quite interesting decisions for pro private client lawyers. Um, Baisley and Wesley Monash IVF was about uh, whether an estate could assert property rights over the deceased's frozen sperm in an IVF clinic. The IVF clinic wanted to destroy it the Australian court said, no, that's property belonging to the estate. So it granted an injunction preventing the destruction of the frozen sperm. In Roblin, a very similar decision, except the question here was whether the frozen sperm was capable of being property for the purposes of the intestacy rules. Um, because the question was whether the wife could inherit uh, so that she could use the sperm to create um, a, a child held that she could because it was property falling within the estate and therefore passed under the intestacy rules. The interesting decision in the sperm cases is much more recent, a case called Cresswell and the Attorney General of Queensland there, and I apologise for having to get a bit graphic on a uh, Wednesday afternoon, but there the sperm was extracted by the girlfriend after death. And the question was whether the um, uh, sperm that had been extracted uh, and then frozen, I should say, uh, belonged to the girlfriend who'd extracted it or the estate. And it was held that it belonged to the girlfriend because um, it only acquired the quality of property once it was extracted. And as that had happened after death, it couldn't fall into the estate. So as you can all see, um, courts across the common law world have had to grapple with um, the implications for some fairly new technology uh, in the probate sphere in some rather esoteric categories of property. And I'd like to uh, consider a slightly more unusual category of property, namely tattoos. Now, you might be thinking, well, a tattoo is on my body. It's not separate. So how could it possibly be something that could be relevant in a probate action? Well, uh, unsurprisingly, it started in America, but it's now in England. There is a company who will come in shortly after death, remove your tattoo and then preserve it and frame it so that your loved ones um, can have it. And in case any of you are interested, here are some examples of their work taken um, from their website. Um, these are some of the more, uh, more straightforward uh, ones that they do. There are some ones that are, are really um, quite impressive um, uh, in their size and, and how much of the body is, is taken. Um, the interesting question though is, well, if I've got one of these tattoos, can I leave it in my will? And that was the question that Julia asked me at um, the Contra conference a couple of years ago. And I said, uh, of course not, uh, that's ridiculous. And then um, uh, when I got home, I thought, well, maybe there is something in it. 
uh, leading to the article that Julia and I wrote together. This, I think, is our answer, um, but it's by no means um, a certain answer. Um, the first question is, do you get, is there such a thing as an enforceable direction to remove a tattoo? So if someone said in their will, I want my tattoo removed, is that enforceable? Well, classically, the answer to that is no, because directions as to things like burial aren't enforceable. But there is one decision of the family courts in 2016 where, although the court didn't go that far, what it did do was grant a whole series of injunctions to ensure that the wishes were in fact carried out and removed the um, personal representatives who wouldn't carry out the rather unusual burial. In that case, it was cryogenic freezing uh, and appointed a personal representative who would. So although, um, although uh, it's, you can't have it enforced as of right, the courts have taken steps to um, uh, give effect to pretty unusual um, burial requests in wills. Um, assume then that the personal representatives in accordance with the direction of will do in fact remove the tattoo. You then get a pretty novel ownership question. Um, the first question is, well, is that removed tattoo capable of being property? Well, given all the cases that I've um, been through, the answer to that, I think, has to be yes. Then the question is, well, is it owned by the personal representatives personally or is it owned by the estate? Now, um, the Australian cases might say, well, it was removed after death, so it's owned by the personal representatives personally. This strikes me, particularly if the, pers uh, the personal representatives have paid for the um, removal with the assets of the estate, but that's a pretty unattractive answer for the common law to come to, and that there might be quite a compelling argument to say that in fact the PRs own it uh, and hold it uh, on trust for the estate. If the tattoo is property of the estate, then the final question is how should it be disposed of? And it's very hard to see why if there isn't some instruction in the estate as to how in the will as to how it should be uh, disposed of, uh, that the tattoo, uh, that the, the personal representative shouldn't dispose of the tattoo in that way. So perhaps um, there is a way, or it might be found to be a way in which you might um, leave your tattoo in a will. Um, is this, as um, uh, Queen famously said, just fantasy? Well, um, Lord Judge, the former Lord Chief Justice, giving the judgment in the Court of Appeal in Yearworth, uh, expressed the view that perhaps um, what had been the position in the 19th century might need to be uh, reconsidered given um, the developments in medical science and perhaps leaving your tattoo in your will uh, is one of them. Thank you. Can I, before you um, dash off Matthew, um, ask you one question which doesn't yes, come through the Q&A function but, but it just struck me as you were talking. Your conclusion about it being an odd result if the PRs owned the tattoo that they'd removed um, themselves rather than holding it for the estate. Um, I completely understand that, but how does that sit with that rather curious case about the partner who'd extracted the sperm post-death? Isn't it, isn't it bang on all fours with that, if that's not an appropriate way of putting it? Well, it is, a, apart from the fact that in that case, the partner wasn't in fact the personal representative. And the battle in Cresswell was between the family members who were the personal representatives who wanted to ensure that the deceased sperm was destroyed. And the girlfriend who, um, before anyone could do anything, had, uh, had brought in specialists to extract the sperm and had obtained it. And so it was a straight fight between uh, those two as to who owned the property. I mean, I can see, I can see the force of Cresswell. Um, I think you're in a slightly different position if, say, the personal representatives are carrying out, even voluntarily, though they might not be obliged to do it, are carrying out a direction in the will to immediately after death and before burial have a tattoo removed and, and given it's a commercial service, pay for it um, with, um, uh, with the estate money. And there's another way of looking at it as well, is that um, you can contract uh, as, a, as an individual make a contract for the say the sale of goods and if that contract is only performed after death the goods that are received become property of the estate so maybe another way to the same answer is for the deceased prior to death to contract for the service um, the goods namely the tattoo being delivered to the estate after death um, there are many interesting ways around this um, given the technology exists I, I can't wait for the first case um, Neither way way you come. Thank you very much. So with the um, hard task of following on from that,
Um, I have to introduce two speakers who, particularly as a result of the pandemic, uh, which has meant it's been so hard to meet face to face, might need a little bit more introduction to many of you um, on the webcast than the rest of today's lineup. Um, those two speakers are Catherine Hartston and Alex Peplow. Catherine and Alex are our two new ju junior tenants at 24 Oil Buildings who joined Chambers after completing their pupillage just last month. I can say without hesitation that they are both absolutely brilliant. They've each had great experience in this area during pupillage, and I have no hesitation at all in recommending them, either of them, as a safe pair of hands for those sorts of matters where, for whatever reason, you're looking for what I might call particularly cost-effective insight. They are going to be talking about how you might get a little bit of an edge in capacity disputes. Uh, so I'll pass on now to Alex and Catherine to tell us about that. Thank you very much for that uh, extremely kind introduction. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. And uh, hopefully that's now appearing to everyone. Uh, I can only apologise that I don't have uh, any exciting pictures in this in the same way that uh, Matthew did. Um, I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about access to health records in the context of probate disputes, and in particular, a uh, recent decision from the Family Division uh, drawing out the disparate treatment given to personal representatives on the one hand and other prospective claimants on the other. And I'm well aware that uh, many attendees of this conference will have a great deal of experience of accessing uh, health records in the context of probate disputes, but I will just touch briefly on the relevant statutory provisions. So under the Access to Health Records Act 1990, uh, and section three, subsection one, where the patient has died, the patient's personal representative and any person who may have a claim arising out of the patient's death may make a request to a record holder for access to a relevant health record. And uh, there is a restriction on this in section five, subsection four, which provides that uh, where such a request is made, uh, access shall not be given uh, to any part of the record which, in the opinion of the holder of the record, would disclose information which is not relevant to any claim which may arise out of the patient's death. Now, the interaction of these two provisions was considered earlier this year by the President of the Family Division in the case of INRI AB. And the President uh, looked at the language of Section uh, 3, Subsection 1, and concluded that uh, it clearly refers to two distinct and destructive categories of applicants, namely the personal representatives on the one hand and any person who may have a claim arising out of the patient's death on the other, and went on to conclude uh, that the restriction in section five, subsection four, uh, relating to the opinion of the record holder as to its relevance, only applies to a person who may have a claim arising out of the pain, patient's death. It does not apply to the personal representatives. Now, what practical impact does this have? Well, on the face of the legislation, it shouldn't have any uh, problematic impact for a non-personal representative prospective claimant because they do have a right to access uh, records which are relevant to a claim that they may wish to bring. But of course, in practice, they are going to have to request that record from the record holder and the record holder might say no. And if the record holder does say no, they may be in a position of having to bring a challenge against that in circumstances where the personal representative would not have to do so if they had made the request. And clearly, if a challenge is brought, that's going to bring with it its own practical difficulties. So the jurisdiction to bring a challenge against a refusal to uh, grant access to the record is under Section 8 of the Act. And a challenge cannot be brought unless the applicant has first taken all steps to secure compliance with an obligation to provide access, as may be prescribed by regulations. And for example, there may be a relevant complaints procedure. In such a challenge under Section 8, uh, the court may inspect the record, which is the subject of the request, but the applicant themselves and their representatives may not. And so they are effectively going into the litigation blind. There's then the uh, tricky question of uh, whether the record holder in refusing uh, has to give reasons for their refusal and whether the court should give weight to 
the opinion of the record holder in refusing or whether the court should simply directly address the question of the record's relevance. And I think it's important to uh, focus on this point because it means that uh, there is an additional hurdle a non-personal representative prospective claimant may have to go through in order to get the all-important health records in the context of a possible capacity dispute. And that disadvantage applies across these big topics that we're constantly advising clients about, namely time. You may be involved in having to uh, go to court against a record holder simply in order to get records that may be relevant to a claim you wish to bring when the clock may be ticking as to a limitation. There's also the cost, obviously, because you may end up having to go through a separate set of proceedings uh, just to get the records when a personal representative would not have to do so. You're clearly at an information disadvantage because you're seeking access to a record uh, and potentially having to challenge a refusal to hand it over when you haven't in fact been able to see the record uh, to know whether you've got good grounds to uh, request it or not. Uh, it's possible that there's no basis on which you could ask for it, but it may be a borderline case and it may be that the opinion uh, is one which cannot stand up. And so all of this affects your litigation risk. And if you are a prospective claimant uh, who's not a personal, representat personal representative, uh, you are uh, clearly at a general disadvantage in seeking to bring your claim. And so it's clearly very important for that category of uh, potential claimants, i.e. non-personal representatives, to act quickly uh, as soon as it becomes clear that there may need to be a capacity dispute in seeking access to uh, the health records from the relevant record holder, because there may be hurdles they have to overcome which a personal representative would not. And on a final note, um, I also like to draw attention to a separate restriction provided by the Access to Health Records Act, uh, which is sub section 5, subsection 3, and that provides that access shall not be given uh, when a request is made for a health record um, to a part of a health record which, in the opinion of the holder of the record, would disclose information provided by the applicant in the expectation it would not be, I'm sorry, provided by the patient in the expectation that it would not be disclosed to the applicant. And the interesting point here is clearly that it matters who the applicant is. But it's not necessarily going to be the case that the personal representative is better off in that circumstance, because, for example, the record holder might form the view that the uh, personal representative is not someone to whom the patient would have expected the record would be disclosed, uh, but another applicant might be. And so there's clearly going to be a, a, a fact-specific uh, analysis that has to be done uh, if the record holder decides uh, that they want to refuse disclosure uh, under this provision. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Catherine, who's going to give us a case update uh, on the topic of testamentary capacity. Thank you, Alex. And as Alex has said, I'm going to do a case update. I'm going to talk about the recent case of Clitheroe and Bond. And that was a successful challenge to two wills on the basis of testamentary capacity. And the argument in that case was that testatrix had suffered from an affective disorder, which had caused irrational delusions. So just turning to the facts of the case, the testatrix had three children, called Debs, Sue and John. Her name was Jean. And Debs sadly passed away in 2009. And that, ev that event had a profound and very serious effect on the family and on Jean in particular. Jean, in her words, took to her bed from 2009 until her death in 2017. And she developed all sorts of fixed ideas about Sue. Ideas such as the idea that Sue had been responsible for the breakdown of Jean's marriage, that Sue had stolen from Jean and from Debs, that Sue was a shopaholic and a spendthrift, and all sorts of fixed ideas. And Sue disputed each and every one of those and said that they were entirely wrong. And under Jean's wills, which were prepared in 2010 and 2013, Sue was excluded from any significant benefit 
and John was the residuary beneficiary. So in this case, the dispute was between John, who was the person propounding the wills, and Sue. And Sue's case was that those fixed ideas were delusions um, and, and they'd caused the making of the wills. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with the Banks and Goodfellow test, which applied here, and we're in the fourth limb concerning insane delusions. That's very old fashioned language, but one has to show that there's a delusion, something that goes beyond a decision that's merely capricious or mean, but something that's entirely irrational. And there's got to also be a causative effect. So it's not enough for a delusion to just exist in the abstract. It's actually got to cause or bring about the disposition in question. So the decision of the court in this case was that Jean did suffer from an affective disorder, which comprised depressive tendencies and a complex reaction to the death of Debs. That Jean's fixed ideas about Sue were irrational delusions and they were caused by the affective disorder and that those delusions had influenced the making of both the 2010 and 2013 wills. And consequently, neither were admitted to probate and instead there was an intestines in intestacy. There was also an alternative case in fraudulent calumny, but that was not made out on the facts. So just a couple of points of note that I'd like to draw out from that. First of all, the type of incapacity, we're talking about an affective disorder here. Secondly, the evidence required to establish that disorder. Uh, it was held by the court that a clinical diagnosis was not necessary. And thirdly, the court provided some helpful clarity around the meaning of a delusion. So thinking about an affective disorder, of course, in Key and Key, it was recognised by Mr Justice Briggs that an affective disorder could impair testamentary capacity. In key, capacity was impaired by a testator's reaction to his bereavement. And in that case, his, his decision-making cap capacity had been imp impaired. So those principles in Clitheroe were applied in a slightly different context. In Clitheroe, there was no issue as to cognition or to decision-making cap capability or function. Instead, the affected disorder was, uh, which was the, um, the, the reaction to grief and also depression, the affective disorder caused insane delusions. So it's interesting to see those principles applied in a slightly different context. Secondly, in terms of the evidence required to establish lack of capacity, it was agreed that John bore the burden of showing that Jean had capacity. And as one would expect, expert evidence was crucial in this case. And John's expert couldn't say that Jean had capacity, but he argued that there wasn't enough evidence to show that she had capacity because there was no lifetime clinical diagnosis of any affective disorder. And furthermore, among the medical records, there wasn't enough evidence to show that every, every symptom that would be necessary for a clinical diagnosis was present on the facts. So he said there wasn't a clinical diagnosis, there wasn't enough evidence for a cl cl clinical diagnosis, and therefore it couldn't be said with certainty that there was a lack of capacity. And the court said that that didn't discharge the burden of proof in the circumstances. It was sufficient if an expert could look at all the evidence and reach a conclusion that there was a lack of capacity on the facts. And the final point to draw out is this definition of delusion. That's very old fashioned language and the court provided some helpful clarity on what it means. So it looked at two different definitions of delusion. The first one in William on Wills is set out there on the screen, a belief in the existence of something which no rational person could believe. And at the same time, it must be shown to be impossible to reason the person out of the belief. There was also another definition from Williams, Mortimer and Sonnox based on ask, positing the question whether somebody in, in possession of their senses could reasonably believe a certain thing. And the point in question was whether that rider on the Williams on Wills definition, whether it was impossible to reason the patient out of that, their belief, whether that was required, because if it was, a party challenging a will would have to show not only that there was something irrational that was a fixed belief, but also that attempts had been made to dissuade that person of those beliefs. And the court said that that wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to show that, uh, that attempts had been made to that, to that effect. And that provided some helpful clarity. And of course, 
This is a very difficult limb of the banks, a good fellow test to establish. It's difficult to collect all the evidence. And uh, a final practical point that I'd mention here is that there was a huge amount of evidence in this case. There were extensive medical records. There were also independent witnesses who supported Sue's case. Um, and so it, this, 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 there was also evidence left by Jean as to her intentions in making the will. So the court could be certain that the affective disorder had caused the dispositions in question. So although it can be difficult to make out a case on this ground, it shows that with the right evidence, it is possible. I'm the first person who forgot to unmute, how embarrassing. Thank you both very much indeed um, for um, those interesting remarks. Next up is Heather Murphy. Heather has lots of excellent advocacy experience. She was in the Supreme Court just a couple of weeks ago. She is the treasurer of the Court of Protection Bar Association, but has particular insight into both court of protection matters and also probate, probate and inheritance disputes. Uh, and in that latter regard, she's currently working, I believe, on a, a multi-million pound private wealth dispute for a particularly wealthy Saudi family. Uh, I assume not inspired by anything she's received from that professional relationship, she's going to talk about lifetime gifts. Thank you very much, Ed. I'm going to endeavour to share my screen with the professionalism that everyone else has achieved and speak on the very seasonally topical question of gifts and particularly gifts within the court of protection. So to begin with the simple question started for 10, what is a gift? Well, I think most of us would simply say that it is a gratuitous transfer of property. Um, and that's a transfer as opposed to one made for consideration. And there can obviously be rules about incomplete gifts and transactions of undervalues and presumptions of about occasions when gifts don't occur instead give rise to a resulting trust. But the transfers are broadly divided into two neat binary categories, those made with consideration and those made without consideration. And the latter category are gifts. So if it's all quite straightforward and as straightforward as that, in that case, what is my talk about? Well, it is the question, when is a gift not a gift? And the answer, to some extent, a bit like a Christmas cracker, is unfortunately when you're dealing with the Court of Protection. So to give this some context and some explanation as to how a gratuitous transfer might not be a gift, let's have a quick look at the Mental Capacity Act 2005. So attorneys, what powers do they have for gifts? It's set out in section 12 of the Act. They have pretty limited powers to make gifts. It's limited to about £3,000 a year. It's got to be a customary occasion or to charity and broadly anything else requires court approval under section 23 sub 4. That famously includes gifts for the purpose of tax planning and section 12 and its operation, particularly in relation to tax planning, is quite clear. This is a restricted provision and attorneys are quite limited in the gifts that they can make. There are very similar provisions for properties and affairs deputies. Deputies can be empowered to make gifts under section 18, it's on the screen, um, and the orders that empower those deputies are often very similar to the orders that an attorney will have. They'll make gifts, but they're of limited value. Now, the operation of both of these provisions can be a little frustrating if you want to engage in tax planning, but because you're so limited in value, they do have the advantage of being a nice, clear, easy rule um, that allows you to work out whether or not you can make small gifts, but for any large amounts, you need to go to court. So far, still so straightforward. So what is the problem? Well, the problem really arises from the fact that the Mental Capacity Act is drafted focusing purely on P. And, and really, its operation it seems to exist. It thinks that there's only P, the attorney or deputy, the court and for property and affairs, some property to manage. And there might be people to consult, but those are the main players. And it thinks about P and the management of P's property in a very siloed way. What it doesn't address or deal with is the idea that P is in many cases part of a family and therefore part of a financial network. And P will have and have had before they lost capacity, jointly owned bank accounts, assets, property that was treated as family property where no one was really bothered about who owned it and have made provision to support their family. And that can be spouses, children, 
wider family. And whenever P loses capacity and the attorney steps or the deputy steps in, how can the attorney or deputy manage those financial situations? Can the attorney or deputy maintain those other people and take over the role that P had? Well, under the uh, previous regime for enduring powers of attorney, an attorney could benefit someone other than the donor. There was that express power. However, that power isn't replicated in the Mental Capacity Act. And unfortunately, one of the problems with the Act is it is very silent on maintenance. And this is where the fudge of when a gift might not be a gift comes into play. So how does the court deal with the question of maintenance in relation to attorneys and deputies? Focusing on deputies to begin with. The court will get round this problem by making an order in the terms on the screen. And that probably falls within the scope of orders that the court can make under section 18.1g because it can empower a deputy to make um, payments even when there is no legal obligation to do so. The OPG guidance in relation to this sort of power and the power that a deputy has and how it should exercise it indicates that there's a situation that's really about maintaining a spouse or a dependent relative or circumstances where there's evidence that previous financial provision has been made in the past and there's likely to be provision so again in the future. And although this seems to get a bit around the problem with gifts because obviously the court can empower and a deputy to make gifts of any size and these are gratuitous payments, there are still two problems with this approach. The first is section 16.4 which is very clear that powers conferred on a deputy should be as limited in scope as they possibly can be so. And if we flick back to the sort of empowering order that the court usually makes, this is incredibly broad. So it's not, although this is the typical order, it's not clear and it hasn't as far as I'm aware been examined as to whether that's really compatible with 16 sub four. The second problem is a more practical problem. If you as a deputy have acquired a power that is this wide, how do you go about exercising it in a proper and appropriate way? So those are your problems if you are a deputy. What about if you are an attorney? Well, the problem for attorneys is that, as we've already looked at, they're caught by Section 12 of the Mental Capacity Act and their ability to make gifts is very limited. So is the position that they are unable to maintain at all without court order? Now, that would certainly be the natural reading of Section 12. And you might also be fortified in coming to that view by the fact that the power to maintain was something that enduring powers of attorney had and was deliberately not replicated in the regime for lasting powers of attorney, i.e. The, the omission was deliberate and there is no power to maintain and LPAs no longer have the power, that power. However, somewhat surprisingly, that is not the view of the court. And in the two slides on the screen, the court came to the view that the attorneys do have a power to maintain, which is separate from their restrictions on gifting. Now, the problem of maintenance within a family unit is a real problem caused, I think, by the way the Mental Capacity Act is drafted, and it's focused solely on P in a very narrow way. However, the solution, if you like, that the court has come up with in these two cases isn't a solution that's very happy. And unfortunately, it's a solution that is going to cause attorneys and deputies and those advising them some problems. And that is because to make this route work, the court has come to the view that not all gratuitous transfers are gifts. And this then leads to the slightly curious question as a property lawyer as to when is a gratuitous transfer not a gift? Well, this was answered insofar as an answer can be articulated in 2019, where the court said that there were two um, elements that needed to be considered. The first is that the gratuitous transfer is not linked to a customary occasion. Now, that's a bit unsatisfactory because if you give me a present on my birthday, it's a gift. If you give me a present before my birthday, a week, it's not a gift. It doesn't really, it's not very clear why customary occasion is so important as to be something inherent within the gift giving aspect. 
And the second obligation that has to be met, the second category that has to be met, is that the attorney is under a degree of obligation. Now, what is meant by this degree of obligation? Well, the court tried to include within it that sometimes the attorney will be under a legal obligation to maintain. And the classic example is a minor child. That's a bit of a red herring because if there is a legal obligation to maintain the minor child, then the attorney is not in gift giving territory. They're discharging legal obligations the same as they're paying a debt and section 12 and this issue doesn't arise. The more difficult question is where you're under an obligation that isn't legal, but as the court decided, it's a moral obligation. So how can this moral obligation arise um, that might require you as a attorney or deputy to consider making a gratuitous transfer that won't be considered a gift? Well, the court said that it can arise in two ways. Firstly, the lasting power of attorney can expressly uh, state that there's a wish for maintenance. That's at least express and clear and you can read it. The second is, is more amorphous. It can arise from wishes and feelings expressed by the donor when they had capacity. So not only do we have a difficult question or concept, a moral obligation rather than a legal one, but they can also arise in implied manners, which makes it very difficult to ascertain. So if these are all of the many problems, what can be done? So for deputies, the first point would be very much check the wording in the order, regardless of which side you are on. Um, the standard wording is very broad. If you are appointing a deputy and you think there's likely to be maintenance, it's pretty probable you'll be able to identify who needs to be maintained, spouse, children, etc. And also actually, the likely sum that that might be, uh, not to impose a ridiculous cap, but if the maintenance over the past 20 years has been 20k a year, then it would seem that actually the standard wording could be easily modified to say the deputy has the power to maintain the spouse and children to a cap of 20, 30, 40,000 pounds a year. Um, it would give the deputy comfort and certainty that as long as they was maintaining those people to this amount, everything was fine. And if needs changed and the amount needed to change or the people needed to change, then the deputy can come back to court. I think that would be a nice uh, balance between protection for the deputy and uh, certainty for everyone else and not overwhelming the court with applications. What happens if you are unhappy with a deputy and how they're acting? and their use of this incredibly broad power. Well, unfortunately, this is very much coached in the use of this language. The use of this power is very much in terms of the best interests of P. And so if the deputy is using this power and has been empowered broadly, and if you want to challenge decisions that the deputy is making to maintain A and not B, it's going to have to be on a best interest basis. And that is unfortunately going to be very difficult and quite uncertain. So if anyone is unhappy with the deputy, I think the major point here is challenging them could be difficult. However, happily, as their deputies, if you do find they acted in breach, the bond will be available to remedy that default. Now, what about attorneys who obviously you don't have the benefit of them having the bond? Well, I think the first point is if you're dealing with an LPA and drafting it and there are people who are likely to need to be maintained or want to be maintained, then I would include provisions in it expressing those um, maintenance desires. But that would advice would have to be given at the risk that the law is uncertain. So it might be fine now, but not in five years time. Secondly, um, it needs to be expressed as wishes, I would like, rather than conditions, you must, because the latter will be found to be incompatible. Um, and really, are there any other asset management tools that can be deployed that will give your clients certainty now rather than relying on this, um, these wishes, which is a really uncertain area of law? What happens if you are an attorney? Well, unfortunately, if you're an attorney, you are faced with this problem, whether or not the LPA expresses any wishes for maintenance at all or not, because the power of maintenance and the moral obligation to provide can arise from past behavior. So 
how do you deal with that? Well, definitely the first point is if in doubt, record. Um, the OPG, in my experience, might dislike the decision you've come to. I think you ought to have come to a different one, but they will be far less critical of you or any of your clients if you have set out clear reasons as to why that decision was made and the factors that were weighed for it. So the sort of trusting minute level. Um, some of them will be quite easy. Long-standing spouse who's got no independent wealth or income, maintenance is obvious. The more difficult will be adult children or siblings where there's no evidence of past performance. So if you have children who are reaching 18 you, uh, and no one has gone before them, would P have funded a car, university, a deposit on the home, grandchildren's school fees, holidays, made payments for tax planning? These are all questions that are going to be very difficult for you to ascertain. Um, and the second point that I would make is really, if you're an attorney, I would exercise great caution because this area of law is quite uncertain. Um, it does seem to impact on Section 12 in a way that's curious in preventing and eliminating those protections. And this might be an area of law that will change relatively soon, potentially quite drastically. And thirdly, what happens if you're concerned that an attorney is misusing the power? Well, this is quite difficult because before these cases, if you were concerned about an attorney or the OPG was investigating, it was quite clear. Has more than £3,000 been spent on gifts? Most of those investigations involve attorneys spending donors' monies on the item for families. But if it was over 3 k you were in breach of the rule of gifts. Nice and simple. Now it's going to be much more difficult to ascertain, particularly in a family where pulling resources and pulling intergenerational resources is common. So in terms of how do you challenge it? Well, you can look at um, past behaviour. Now, past behaviour is likely to be a relatively unreliable narrative because depending on whether or not they're in receipt, P was either very generous or P thought that people should stand on their own two feet. It's going to be difficult to assist. Frequency and amount will be quite useful in comparison to the size of the estate. You might be able to say, well, these are out of step. But you may well end up falling back on attacking the decision-making process. And I think this could be one of the best angles of attack. And that's if you can't easily attack the decision to maintain that particular payment, try attacking the process. How did the attorney come to these decisions? What are the records that they've maintained? How did they weigh their best interests? Because if they haven't gone through those steps, it might be much easier for you to undermine that specific decision to maintain. Now, those are the solutions that hopefully will see you through until either the court clarifies these issues or to make the matter much clearer, the Mental Capacity Act is resolved to amend um, and resolve to is amended to resolve this issue. And I think if there is any time, I see some questions have arrived. I but think, um, if there are anything else, I think, else, there, I think there isn't. Can I ask you just because of time to yes. try and reply to them using the system? And I should say there have been some interesting questions already asked for which thank you very much and those people tuning in might like to um, have a look at in between talks when I'm droning on and you can not listen as carefully. Um, thank you very much indeed Heather. Um, next up is Elizabeth Weaver. She is quite simply splendid and it's therefore entirely unsurprising to those that know her that she was up for Chancery Junior of the Year at last week's Chambers and Partners Bar Awards. She's going to be speaking about issues in relation to insolvent estates which is fitting given that one of her biggest cases in recent years concerned the Berezovsky estate, uh, which was, of course, uh, an insolvent one. So without further ado, over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Ed, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Lord Mishcon is quoted in Hansard as having said that insolvency is not a very thrilling or amusing subject. So I'm afraid I've got no thrilling or amusing slides to share with you. However, it is an important one, especially um, as we are living through what has been described as um, times of unprecedented economic difficulties. So I'm going to look at two issues relating to the administration of estates that are or may be insolvent. Um, let's start with a brief recap of the statutory framework that applies when a person dies insolvent, but without any bankruptcy proceedings on foot. Um, and the framework is contained in Section 421 of the Insolvency Act 1986 and in the snappily named 
the administration of insolvent estates of deceased persons order 1986, which I'm going to call the 1986 order. Um, section 421 defines an insolvent estate in these terms. For the purposes of this section, an estate of a deceased person is insolvent if, when realized, it will be insufficient to meet in full all the debts and other liabilities to which it is subject. So that's an assets test, not a cash flow test. And of course, an estate isn't insolvent uh, simply because it can't pay all the legacies in full. In that case, uh, the legacies will usually abate subject to any contrary intention in the will. Now, section three of the order provides for the administration of the estate under the bankruptcy regime. A creditor or the deceased's personal representatives can apply for an insolvency administration order. Um, if an order is made, a trustee in bankruptcy, an insolvency practitioner will be appointed and specific provisions of the Insolvency Act with certain modifications, which are all set out in the schedule to the 1986 Act, sorry, 1986 order, um, will apply to the administration. The alternative is for the estate to be administered outside the bankruptcy regime. Um, and Article 4 of the 1986 order states that the law of bankruptcy shall apply to the administration with respect to the respective rights of secured and unsecured creditors, the debts and liabilities that are provable, the valuation of future and contingent liabilities, and the priority of debts and other payments. Um, and it also provides that reasonable funeral, testamentary and administration expenses have priority over all the unsecured creditors. Um, in this case, an insolvency practitioner doesn't have to be involved. And as I read Article 4, there is no need for the involvement of the court. You don't need a court order to administer an estate outside bankruptcy. Although it may be that if an application for directions is made, uh, a direction that it should be so administered may be sought. So, What's, which of these options um, should the uh, PRs be considering? Well, it seems to me that the insolvency administration order may be the appropriate route. First, if the estate is clearly insolvent and there are one or more creditors who have undisputed debts. Um, in that sort of case, it might be sensible for those who would be entitled to a grant to renounce and to allow the creditor to take a grant or even to petition for an order without a grant. Um, and that's what's happened in the case called Reed Ballard. Um, that was a very small estate. Uh, the deceased had died intestate. There were no next of kin, um, but there was a creditor who was the local authority um, and they were owed fees uh, for residential care. Uh, the Treasury solicitor refused to take out a grant because of the insolvency. And the court decided that it had jurisdiction to make an administration order without requiring the creditor to take out a grant um, and without requiring them even to advertise for creditors in order to save costs. At the other extreme, um, an insolvent administration order will be appropriate, obviously, in a large complex estate where there may be issues about finding and getting in assets. Um, and that's because, of course, the trustee will be able to use the powers available under the Insolvency Act uh, to investigate and then, if necessary, challenge transactions such as transactions that prejudice creditors. Um, the trustee will, of course, have powers to disclaim property, to sell the matrimonial home and so on. The downside, of course, um, are the costs. There will be the extra layer of bankruptcy costs um, and they will rank first. Um, in a case where the beneficiaries are all members of the deceased's family, uh, there may also be a perception of loss of control to the insolvency practitioner. Um, and so for those reasons, uh, the person representatives, especially of their professionals, may de decide to administer the estate outside bankruptcy. Um, the basic principle, of course, is the obvious one. The creditors of the deceased and the estate must be paid in priority to the beneficiaries. Um, and if the administrators or exec, um, fail to fulfill that obligation because they distribute to beneficiaries without paying creditors or because they don't follow the prescribed order as between creditors, then they are likely to be personally liable to the creditors. And the creditors 
principal resource will of course be to the PRs. Um, the creditors can sue the beneficiaries, but only if they haven't got uh, remedies against the personal representatives. The personal representatives can in turn look to the beneficiaries to whom they've made distributions for refund or indemnity. But of course, if the money is gone, um, that's not much of a remedy. So um, the short point, of course, is that if it's not clear whether the estate is in fact insolvent because creditors' claims are disputed or contingent, or because there is doubt as to whether all the creditors have in fact come to light, um, the personal representatives can neither distribute the estate nor pay off the known creditors. Um, advertisement under Section 27 of the Trustee Act um, won't protect them in respect of claims which come to light after the advertised time for notifying claims has expired, but before the estate has been distributed, because obviously the um, personal representative will be on notice. So what can be done? Well, obviously, you the personal representatives could distribute the estate with a retention or against an indemnity from the beneficiaries or if they can get it with the benefit of insurance. But the obvious problem is that if the retention or security or in, insurance is insufficient to meet all the subsequent claims, the personal representatives will be on the hook. The only way of ensuring protection against that risk is to apply to the court for sanction to distribute. And that can be done with or without a retention or with or without a secured indemnity. Um, and there are two guiding principles for the court. The first is that it's not right for the court order to create security for creditors that they would not otherwise have. But the court will consider whether and if so, what indirect protection should be extended. Um, where it is not certain that the estate is or will be insolvent, it is wrong to disregard the interests of the beneficiaries altogether in favour of the creditors. Um, as Chief Master Marsh said in the recent case of Stoddard, the duty on personal representatives is not absolute. It's a duty to take reasonable steps in the circumstances to locate and identify unascertained creditors. But that has to be balanced against the expectation on the part of the beneficiaries that they will get their entitlement under the will or the intestacy within a reasonable period. If there are a number of ascertained and admitted creditors and only a remote possibility of other claims, then it may be appropriate for the court to order distribution on the basis of the payment of the known claims leaving the remote creditors to their personal remedy against the beneficiaries. Um, in the case of re -K deceased, that's exactly what happened. Um, the court authorised the personal representatives to distribute without any provision for stale claims, but with a retention for as a fighting fund in case any such claims came to light. Um, Interesting to note that the court allowed that application to be made without notice to the potential creditors uh, to avoid the risk of a stirring up sleeping dogs. If the court is considering whether or not to allow distribution against a retention, um, it's going to consider the factors um, that you need to have a retention, but it doesn't need to be sufficient to pay in full whatever cl claims might arise. What you have to do is to take a practical view of the reasonable probability of future demands. Now, the advantage of um, this approach, obviously, is that it protects the executor. Even if the retention or security is exhausted, uh, there won't be personal liability to the creditors. The downside is it leaves the PRs on the hook. It doesn't finalise the administration. Um, the second issue that I just want to look at briefly um, is that the estate turns out to be insolvent and a, petitioner, uh, a creditor petitions in the future for an order to put the estate into the bankruptcy regime. That creates a problem because of the way the 1986 order modifies the operation of Section 284 of the Insolvency Act. And the effect of that modification is that any disposition of property, including cash payments, 
by a bankrupt in the period between the date of death and the making of the order, which could be years later, um, will be void unless the transaction is made with the consent of the court or is subsequently ratified. So in the cautionary tale of Dick and Kendall Freeman, the trustee in bankruptcy was able to recover the fees paid to the solicitors who'd been administering the estate, and the court refused to ratify the payment because the solicitors should have realized that there was a risk of insolvency and should have been more careful about incurring expenditure. So the moral is, if there's any risk of insolvency, as well as considering whether to administer in, in or out of bankruptcy, the PR should consider applying to the court for ratification of any payments made and for prospective validation of future expenditure. If they make such an application, um, there are two linked issues. The first is, will the court order um, that the payment should be saved from being made automatically void? Secondly, will the court make an order that protects the payments from future challenge by beneficiaries under the normal practice of challenging the final estate accounts? Um, and the court may well be willing to prevent Section 284 applying while preserving the right of beneficiaries to challenge the level of expenditure. Um, and that's the order that was made in the National Westminster Bank and Lucas case, um, which was the case that dealt with Jimmy Savile's estate. Um, the test for obtaining ratification or validation is that where the executors are on notice that the estate may be insolvent, they have to demonstrate that the disposition or payment was made in good faith for the benefit of the estate as a whole, including the interest of the creditors. So that means they have to show that they were getting in or preserving rather than depleting assets. Um, and the problem in the Freeman Kendall case was that a lot of costs had been run up in unreasonable defense of claims by the major creditor. On the other hand, where PRs have made applications in good time, generally the court is fairly sympathetic to making validation orders. So the takeaway point in dealing with insolvent estates has to be, if there's any doubt, apply to court and apply as soon as possible. In the Studdard case that I mentioned earlier, Chief Master Marsh referred to the court having adopted an iterative approach to providing guidance. And what I think that means is that the court will be sympathetic to applications for directions, even if they are only directions about the direction of travel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for guiding us in that direction, Liz. <laughs> uh, next up, we have uh, another double hander. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce Timothy Sherwin and Alina Gerasimenko. Tim um, recently was crowned, um, I think it was rising st star of the junior bar under 10 years call at the Chamber's High Net Worth Awards, uh, for which we are all delighted. Um, the judges said that he entered the High Net Worth Guides Chancery rankings this year with a storming return of feedback from some of the top instructing solicitors in the market. Um, he's joined by Alina, um, who no doubt will be rising to similar ranks in years to come. She has lots of experience as well in this area, probate disputes, um, inheritance disputes, court of protection disputes, and particular experience recently with 1975 Act claims. I think one of the most recent hearings she did was an FDR um, in a 1975 Act claim. So without further ado, I will hand on to them to give us some highlights of the recent caseload that has been troubling the courts. Thanks very much. I hope I've, um, I'm about to share my screen. There we are. Um, we're going to just do a whistle stop tour through some key procedural uh, points which have arisen in the past year or so. Um, and given that there are so many of them, because as we know from uh, practicing in this area, that probate disputes, succession disputes and court of protection disputes seem to be ballooning, uh, both in terms of the number of cases that have been, are being brought uh, in terms of the number of reported decisions, and I think that applies a fortiori in the Court of Protection, where there seem to be uh, many more Court of Protection dis uh, judgments publicised, uh, there is something of a wealth of material to choose from. So I'm going to start by uh, looking at, if I can, about three uh, topics. The first, I'm going to have a quick look at applications to remove personal representatives, 
and what I'm going to tentatively suggest might be the emergence of a, a new test or slightly reduced hurdle. Second, I'm going to think about uh, the remedy of the common account uh, and uh, when it is that you've given enough. And finally, I'm going to quickly whiz through uh, some uh, recent call for protection decisions uh, relating to uh, party and information requests and the, the question of joining or informing uh, respondents. First of all, then, the application to remove personal representatives. Um, the, that obviously uh, a picture of uh, Cromwell dissolving the rump parliament there, telling them to, they've done enough and they need to go. So the, the test is the power in, uh, sorry, the power is uh, in section 50 of the Administration of Justice Act. Um, it's important to remember that there is no inherent jurisdiction for the court to remove personal representatives. Uh, the uh, power is purely a, a creature of statute, um, but that power is very broad. It applies both to administrators and executors, and of course, executors even before they have the benefit of the grant of probate. Uh, notwithstanding the fact there is no inherent jurisdiction, the court applies the same test as it does under its inherent jurisdiction to administer trusts and remove trustees. The classic case of Letterstedt and Breurs uh, from 1884, and that, of course, the test is the interests of the estate and the welfare of the beneficiaries. Now, there have been a string of quite interesting recent cases, um, most of which seem to have come in front of the chief master. So we're, uh, we're, 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 we're very much benefiting from his view on this area of law. The first one I want to briefly mention is Long and Rodman from 2019. Now, this was a, a contested application to remove a, uh, an administrator, and in fact, a successful one, a partner of McFarlane's was, uh, or I think he may now be a consultant at McFarlane's, was uh, replaced, uh, excuse me, he, he became the new uh, administrator in place of a former administrator. But what's interesting, I think, in this case, for my purposes, is a hint of a move towards a different sort of standard of test to that which has uh, commonly been the case. It, it, it is not unusual, or certainly was not unusual in the past, for there to be disputed trials of removal applications. And it was certainly the case that when allegations, serious allegations, allegations of bad faith or allegations of breach of duty were alleged, it was said that that had to be pleaded and proved in the ordinary way. What the Chief Master said in Long and Rodman there, paragraph 20, was that that would not normally be the case. He, would, he didn't expect that there would normally, and I emphasise normally, be any finding on disputed facts for the purposes of an application under Section 50. And thus, where serious allegations, and those included allegations that the, uh, uh, the fiduciary, the PR, was in a conflict of interest position, the test was, was there a reasonable prospect of that allegation succeeding? A point he picked up from a, an earlier decision uh, of uh, a deputy master, deputy master Linwood. Now that's quite interesting, I think, because while those are um, on the face of it procedural points, i.e. a general direction that there not be trials of these matters and then a question of what the test is, it does, I think, start to water down the substantive law in this area because it, it, it weakens the hurdle or at least weakens the factual basis on which the court is going to uh, act in order to remove uh, executors or administrators. And that uh, principle was picked up by no uh, uh, lesser man than Chief Master Marsh in his subsequent decision in Schumacher and Clark from this year. Now Schumacher and Clark is I think a very interesting case. It concerns the estate of Zaha Hadid, the well-known Iraqi English uh, architect. And this was a directions hearing as opposed to a uh, final hearing, uh, as was the case in Long and Rodman. In this case, um, the defendants to the application which, or, or the claim, which was brought by way of part seven claim and fully pleaded out, were arguing that there should be two things. Firstly, trial by High Court judge. Uh, and secondly, uh, a fully contested trial with live evidence and cross-examination, because they said that there were allegations of bad faith. And the, the chief master used this as an opportunity. He, um, he, he gave directions, but then reserved judgment and handed, handed down judgment subsequently to clarify um, what he considered the basic procedural points were. And I've set out what I think the key take home points from this judgment are on the slide. 
And I think the, the bits I've highlighted are particularly important. Um, the first one, it will often suffice for the court to conclude that a party has made out a good arguable case about the issues that are raised. If there is a good arguable case about the conduct of one or more of the executors or trustees, that may well be sufficient to engage the court's discretionary powers under Section 50 or the inherent jurisdiction and make some change of administrator or trustee inevitable. And I think it's striking there how low a test that is. A good arguable case, i.e. effectively the test for summary judgment or, or, or application for a service out or similar, is not a very high test. And yet if that, if that in certain circumstances makes the removal inevitable, that does, I think, water down the test or certainly moves towards a watering down of that same test. Um, now, that's not to say that the Leschet and Brewers test has been abandoned. You see in the next paragraph, um, you've got uh, the welfare of the beneficiaries cropping up. But again, you've got that in the context of real concerns, as opposed to, for example, uh, a found fact that there is some matter which is, in fact, over, uh, as against the balance of probabilities, impacting the welfare of the beneficiaries. And finally here um, on this case, or nearly finally on this case, you can see that I've highlighted the section there saying that it was unfortunate that the claimant commenced this claim using part seven procedure. Um, you shouldn't use part seven procedure um, because at the end does not inevitably lead to a trial with cross-examination of witnesses. And the chief master said it was only really in cases where bad faith or fraud was being alleged that you would have cross-examination of witnesses. And again, that's a striking fact, but I think a claimant friendly fact or, or finding, because it suggests that really all you have to do is, is hit a relatively low hurdle before the court's jurisdiction was engaged. I think two other practical points come out of these two cases. The first is that the Chief Master said, despite this being quite a large estate, uh, that they would ordinarily be tried by master. Um, and second, and I think more importantly, in the, in the common run of uh, cases in Long and Rodman, he explained that he considered that uh, in these claims or in these applications, evidence should be given by the individuals uh, who are actually making them and, and rather than by way of witness statement on, by solicitor on instructions. And because the court wanted to hear the real voice of the parties, somewhat ironically, of course, when uh, you don't then get to cross-examine them, but there we are. Moving uh, hopefully relatively swiftly on then to the question of counts. Um, when have you given enough? And I think this is intimately related to the question of removal, because as, as was said in Long and Rodman, one of the key issues on removal is often um, whether or not uh, a full or proper or indeed any account has been given by the PR. So the uh, current law is uh, most uh, exhaustively and conveniently set out in Henshaw and Thompson, um, which I've just, I've just cited the key snippet from their paragraph 60. The court just has a discretion. It's a general discretion, but although it would not be right to say there's a presumption in favour of making such an order, in my judgment, the court will not decline to make an order likely where a trustee, here read administrator or, or executor, holds or has held asset for the beneficiary of the trust, square brackets, or estate. Now that, 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 that was tested in a case called al San against al Salem in 2019, which was not an estates case. It was a, it was a, a, a property development uh, alleged fraud case where um, the defendants were said to have been fiduciaries in, in respect of a, a complex real property business. Um, and the court found that they weren't, but an application was made or a claim was made within those proceedings for an account. And it's worth noting that, that his honor judge Hodge QC, sitting as a judge of the high court, found that there was no limitation period in respect to the claim for a common account. And again, I think that's important from the point of view of estate litigation, because it means you can always bring an accounting type claim, but also within the context of an application under Section 50, failure to account will be an ongoing failure, i.e. one which is not barred or blocked by the limitation period. And, and, and despite that being what Chief Master Marsh said in Henshaw and Thompson, having it approved at high court level obviously gives it a uh, greater weight as a matter of stare decisis. But, capital but, uh, only very rarely will a court make an order for an account if any money claims that fell out of that account would be time barred. So obviously the court, to, uh, to quote uh, his honour Judge Hodge QC, will not all act, equity will not act in vain. 
So it's a good it's a good sign for claims like uh, Section 50 applications where there is no, you're not looking for a money uh, uh, remedy, less helpful for uh, breach of trust or breach of duty type claims. That was finally picked up in by a judgment of our old friend Chief Master Marsh again in Ball and Ball, where he's, he focused here on an accounting exercise between three trustees of, a, of, a, of some will trusts um, who had uh, massively fallen out, three siblings, and, and they, they, they sought an account from one of the trustees. And he focused really on the, on the test for when an account has been properly given. He, he, he considered that information is the key aspect of accounting, um, and he, but he said that as a result of that, the level of detail will vary. That was a case where there were only really eight assets in the estate. And even though the information that was given wasn't as good as it could have been, you don't actually need a great deal of information he found in respect of eight assets and their management over time. That said, normally there is no need for a trial or cross examine or cross-examination since the threshold for making such an order is low. And he gets that from his own judgment in Hen Henry and Thompson. And again, I think it's an example of these sort of applications or the threshold for these sort of applications being somewhat watered down, which again, I think is claimant friendly. That said, less claimant friendly and more of a practical point for defendants or those acting for fiduciaries, there is no set form of account. And given that at heart, the obligation is to inform and where expl explanation is required to explain, just telling the claimant or the, or the beneficiary or the, or the co-fiduciary what had happened and trying to be as upfront and honest as possible really does diffuse these sorts of situations and enables the court to say, no, enough is enough, uh, sufficient information has now been given. Moving on then from uh, those two, I think, interlinked issues of accounting and the removal of personal representatives, we move on to uh, a, a, an interesting series of cases in the Court of Protection. Um, the uh, question about when you can be joined as a party and what information ought to be given. That's obviously uh, the door knocker from Durham Cathedral. Uh, that isn't a selfie, although uh, you may uh, think otherwise. Um, so, starting point, uh, COP rules 9.3 for adding uh, uh, non-parties, um, and a decision of uh, in RE-SK, which was a, a, a sad case involving an individual who had been um, hit by a bus uh, and, and effectively severely crippled, including uh, mentally uh, uh, crippled, so P there um, there were proceedings both against, uh, both against the, um, I think the bus driver, I think it was a, a, the bus driver's company, and again, and in respect of the administration of his estate. Um, so two parties applied to be joined. The first was the bus driver, who was interested in the outcome of the Court of Protection proceedings, who's concerned that any declarations made therein might bind him or affect the claim against, um, against him. And secondly, uh, P's brother, who uh, wanted to make his views known in the Court of Protection proceedings. Um, the court joined C's brother, um, but didn't join the bus driver. The reason for the non-joinder of the bus driver was effectively that, it, that, that his position would be sufficiently protected by him not being a party, because he wouldn't be bound uh, by the proceedings as, insofar as they affected the se separate set of proceedings. Whereas the court was interested to know what the views of the brother, somebody who knew intimately P uh, 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 and had obviously interacted and got, got, got a grip on his wishes and feelings, what those views were. And it was most convenient that he do, that he provide those views by way of being a party. Now that was uh, a different weight was put on the next cat, uh, case, which is the re Z case, the uh, part of the ongoing Z litigation. Um, where um, the nephew of P sought to be joined in the course of proceedings. Um, the court refused the joinder of the nephew, a, a relatively unusual case, I think, where a family member won't be joined, although we'll, we'll come on to see another one shortly. Um, and the judge, Miss Justice Norris, uh, his analysis was, was that started from the point of view that while the, proce the proceedings are not adversarial and the role of the court is inquisitorial, i.e. the judge is really looking for viewpoints, but it doesn't necessarily formally matter how those viewpoints are obtained. And so the court will be as happy if those viewpoints can be supplied by way of witness statement or other or, or, or anything else. For example, a letter could be written to the court. 
as it would be uh, if the party were joined. Now, I think that, as I say, is a slightly surprising decision because normally you would expect family members to be joined, or at least it would be uncontroversial for family members to be joined. But I think a lot of what happened in that in that judgment can be explained by the fact that the nephew also was uh, intimating commercial claims against Z or against Z the state. And I think the judge was uh, unhappy with the idea that those claims be ventilated or at least given some oxygen within the course of the court of protection proceedings. Now that, that, that position can be tested by an old case in uh, called B, which deals with, uh, which is a judgment of Miss Justice Millet as he then was, which was a case uh, concerning service and, 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 and uh, on parties. And he considered that the key test was really whether that person had information to share or that person had, would be affected by the order such that, such that they should be joined so their views could be uh, articulated from their own point of view. But he said, of course, there will be exceptional cases in which it might be right to exclude a party from proceedings, uh, delay, cost, embarrassment and exacerbation of family dissensions are relevant matters, but only in the most exceptional circumstances should uh, the considerations to which I have referred namely binding parties and, and the, all views being before the court be overridden. A striking example of that was the recent case of M and P, um, which uh, should be 2020, you'll be unsurprised to see, not uh, 202. Uh, and that was a case where the son of, the, of P had, uh, was deep into drink and drugs, he had made threats to kill various family members, and he was uh, in, in the habit of making demands for money. Um, an application was made by P's attorneys for a statutory will, and normally, of course, in those circumstances, you are required to join people who had benefits under prior wills or would have benefits under the statutory will in question. And there was no doubt that in both cases, the son, he already had a benefit, he was a discretionary beneficiary of a will trust, and he was going to be a discretionary beneficiary of a will trust. But given the exceptional circumstances of the danger uh, uh, represented by the son, the uh, court dispensed with service or even notification on the son um, for two reasons, effectively. First, there was a serious disadvantage. There was, a, I think, a real danger on the evidence in that, in that case. And secondly, there was no prejudice to the son involved because that son, um, what his, his entitlement under the prior will and under the statutory will would remain the same. And the final uh, case I want to look at is the most recent decision uh, in the Z litigation, uh, which was an application for information by the son of P um, in order to gain access to proceedings, uh, information from prior court of protection proceedings of which he was notified, uh, but to which he had not been joined as a party. Now the court considered the, the, uh, that, that, that application with some care and uh, concluded that uh, this wasn't a case where the, um, the DRING principle of open justice was necessarily engaged or rather wasn't fully engaged because obviously the court of protection proceedings are private. And so there wasn't, it wasn't going to be the case that the proceedings would be open to scrutiny by the media or the public more generally. Mr. Justice Morgan held there had to be a good reason for the disclosure. And he considered that in the, on the facts of that case, there weren't. But interestingly, he also suggested that it was open for the son to apply or, or write to the attorney or the deputy of the of P in question and request information from uh, them, which obviated to some extent the need for the court to grant the information sought. It's worth noting that that case did, permission to appeal that case was granted, but the appeal was, uh, was compromised uh, prior to the hearing of the appeal. So I think the take home points from that are that the question of joinder and information granting will often be very finely fact sensitive, but there's a real focus in these decisions on firstly the inquisitorial nature of the court. The court wants all the information, it wants all the information and all the relevant people, really regardless of how that happens. And secondly, apart from that, the focus is on P, P's best interests are what the court is looking to get to in its inquisitorial role. And it doesn't really, it isn't really concerned in seeking to adjudicate side issues like, you know, liability for negligence or, or commercial claims against P's estate. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Alina. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And I'm hoping that I can also share my screen so that you can 
have a look at some slides. There we go. And I'll, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to launch straight in. So the first case that I'm looking at is uh, the case of Kelly and Brennan. Now that's an interesting decision because it appears to be the first time that the court um, has dealt with re the rectification of a foreign will of a testator domiciled in England. Uh, briefly, some facts. So Mr. Kelly was born in Ireland in the 1930s. He moved to England in the early 1970s and remained there for the next 44 years until his death. So naturally, the vast bulk of his assets were in England, save for some family land in Ireland. Mr. Kelly made a will in 2010 with a firm of solicitors in Athy in County Kildare, as Mr. Kelly's family were long-standing clients of that firm. And in fact, he'd made an earlier will in 2006 with the same firm. Both wills gave Mr. Kelly's address as being in Ireland. Now, his instructions for the 2010 will were recorded in a short attendance note, which made his intentions very clear. He wished to divide the residue of his estate into six equal shares, five shares for each of his surviving brothers and sisters, and the sixth share to be divided equally between his late sister's five children. Unfortunately, there was a clerical error when the 2010 will was typed, uh, such that the will simply listed all 10 of the beneficiaries and then added in equal shares, absolutely. Now, clearly, there was a very strong case for rectification, since the effect of the error was that the five defendant nephews and nieces would receive an unintended windfall uh, from the DC state and the gifts to the surviving siblings would be reduced. The issue that arose is that the rules of jurisdiction on testamentary succession in, um, as set out in Dicey, for example, dealt with issues of capacity, uh, issues of formal validity, material or essential validity, and interpretation. In essence, pursuant to those rules, the court can apply domestic law to a foreign will of a testator who was domiciled in the jurisdiction. However, neither Dicey nor any other authority dealt with the issue of which law is to be applied where the question is one of rectification. Well, domicile was clearly relevant in order to determine which law was to be applied. Uh, so the court first had to decide where Mr. Kelly was domiciled. Uh, Martha Schumann found that decision fairly easy on the evidence. Mr. Kelly was domiciled in England, both when he died and when he gave instructions for his will in 2006 and in 2010. She placed no weight on the fact that those wills gave addresses in Ireland when the overwhelming factual evidence was that the deceased had settled in London indefinitely. Uh, Martha Schumann <laughs> noted that rectification does not sit easily within any of the rules in Dicey that had been set out for her, and that it was a striking that there is no specific treatment of rectification in either Dicey or Theophilde on wills. So how did she resolve this issue? Well, she considered that there was a strong analogy uh, to be drawn between rectification on the one hand and essential validity and interpretation on the other. Essential validity is, of course, concerned with questions of whether the will, though formally valid, contains provisions to which the law will not give effect, for example, because it doesn't make reasonable financial provision for a dependent, so it covers things like the 1975 Act. And interpretation is, of course, concerned with giving effect to the intentions of the testator. Now, as part of that, Master Schumann agreed with the counsel for the claimant that the following hypothetical example provides a good sense check and um, explain why uh, that decision must be correct. So if a note of a testator's intention is clear that he intends nine beneficiaries and the will names ten in error, the reference to the tenth beneficiary uh, would be omitted as a matter of essential validity or construction. If the testator's intention was to have 10 beneficiaries, but the will only names nine in error, this could only be corrected by rectifying the will to add the 10th name. And there is simply no good reason for drawing a distinction between these two cases as to which law should apply. Accordingly, in Kelly and Brennan, it was appropriate to apply the English law uh, of rectification as the law of domicile, to the issue arising under the 2010 will. Uh, 
I'll now talk very briefly about uh, the further guidance that's been given in a series of recent cases as regards delay in bringing claims, uh, both under the 1975 Act and for rectification under the, administrator, uh, un under the Administration of Justice Act 1982, um, because in fact Kelly and Brennan also uh, considered permission. You can find some further detail on the applicable principles in my private client update from the 19th of May 2020, which is on our website. But very briefly, uh, both Section 4 of the 1975 Act and Section 20, subsection 2 of the AGA 1982 prescribe a six month time limit. Of course, every application will turn on the individual circumstances of the case, but some points of general principle have been clarified by the recent decisions. So let's have a quick whiz through those. The purpose of the time limit is to bring a measure of certainty and avoid complications which might arise if distributions from the estate are made before the proceedings are brought. It is not designed to protect the court from stale claims. As a corollary of that, there is no disciplinary element to those sections. The time limit should not be enforced for its own sake, and it is wrong to apply the Denton jurispr jurisprudence to an application for permission. Further, the power to extend time may be exercised even if there is no good reason for the relevant delay, so long as other relevant factors weigh in favour of exercising it. However, of course, where there is a lengthy delay, the court will look for an explanation for the delay, and the absence of one would be a powerful factor against the granting of permission. And finally, it's important to analyse the effect of the delay in any particular case, bearing in mind the purpose of the time limit, and thus consider the prejudice caused if the application is permitted or refused. Generally, where there's been no distribution of the estate, the delay is likely to be less prejudicial. Now, as I said, uh, Kelly and Brennan is actually relevant to this topic as well, um, because here the claim was brought some three years um, after the relevant six months had expired. And Martha Schumann emphasised that whilst the guidance regarding delay in the 1975 Act cases, including Cowan, um, was important and it should be considered in the context of out of time claims for rectification, the approach to the latter should be more flexible for a number of reasons. Uh, the first was the fundamentally different nature of the claims. So rectification claims uh, seek to find the true testamentary intention and give effect to it. Whereas 1975 Act claims, as she put it, um, can effectively drive a coach and horses through the wishes of the test data. And finally, um, she identified a practical reason, and that is that rectification claims are often an alternative to a claim for a declaration as to the true meaning, meaning of the will. And for a declaration such that there's, there's no time constraint and significantly no protection for the executor. So there's a potential risk that the, if we apply too restrictive an approach to the time limit under section 20, then a court may, in trying to achieve a, a result where the will truly reflects the testamentary intentions, will strain too far into interpretation on this alternative claim. And that could lead to an executor being exposed many years later for distributing on the wrong basis. And finally, I'll move on to some interesting developments regarding the treatment of CFA uplifts in, 19, in the context of 1975 Act claims. I hope you'll find them interesting. So as a result of section 44 of, and I'm just going to call it LASPO, um, section 58A6 of the Courts and Legal Services Act 1990 now reads, a costs order made in the proceedings may not include provision requiring the payment by one party of all or part of a success fee payable by another party under a conditional fee agreement. Accordingly, it's been, well, until recently, been accepted that successful 1975 Act claimants who brought their claims with the benefit of a CFA were limited to recovering their base costs from the defendants of the litigation and that the claimant would have to shoulder the burden of paying any success fee themselves, because there's simply no um, distinguishing between 1975 Act claims and other claims um, under LASPO. Uh, this gives rise to an obvious problem, 
1975 Act cases, the court is concerned with making provision for claimants based on its assessment of their reasonable financial needs. If those claims are brought under a CFA, which has a success fee, potentially a large part of that award will be exhausted by payment of that success fee, thereby upsetting the balance uh, that the court has struck. And this issue was noted by Mr Justice Briggs, as he then was in his substantive judgment in the case of Lilliman and Lilliman um, at 71, where he said of the net estate uh, that he'd summarised, that ignores the contingent liability for the costs of the, these proceedings, which I am unable either to quantify or to guess as to their likely incidence as between the estate and Mrs Lilliman. Council were united in submitting that I have no alternative but to leave the contingent cost liabilities entirely out of account, ha however unrealistic in the real world that might prove to be. He then went on to comment in the cost judgment, um, as shown on the slide, on the disparity that this gives rise to, namely that judges and financial remedy proceedings have long had the power to adjust the division of marital assets in order to take cost into account, where not doing so would run the risk of frustrating the court's assessment of the party's financial needs. For example, where the overreport is not very big or the needs are very high uh, due to significant care needs, for example. So turning now to three recent cases dealing with these issues. The first is Ree Clark. Um, now, in that case, the judge calculated the claimant widow's capitalised needs for nursing care for the remainder of her life at just below 700,000. The claimant also sought to include some 192,000, um, representing a 100% success fee as part of her needs. Well, Ree Clark kept the position as everyone had understood it to be following LASPO. Uh, Deputy Master Linwood found that responsibility for a success fee under a CFA must remain with the party who entered into the CFA and he gave five reasons for that. Um, one was that the calculation of damages as a matter of procedure carried out before costs are concerned. It has never included an element of or for costs and as a as an aside, it's not entirely clear why he referred to the award in the 1975 Act claim as damages, but there we go. Uh, second, to permit otherwise would be contrary to the deliberate policy of the legislature. Third, it would amount to an increase in damages by way of cost. Fourth, it may put a CFA funded litigant in a better position in terms of negotiations. And finally, there is no reason why a claimant seeking reasonable financial provision should be in a better position than the one seeking, for example, damages for personal injury. However, um, earlier this year, there was an unreported judgment of His Honour Judge Gosnell, which marked a complete 180 as regards the approach taken to this issue. There, the judge stated that he was entitled to take the success fee liabilities into account, both because they fall within the claimant's financial needs and because they are debts incurred since the death and the court is enjoined to make the assessment under the Act at the date of trial and not at the date of death. And whilst he was sympathetic to the defendant's arguments that these are not costs that could in law be awarded against the defendant, um, he thinks he thought that it was useful to look to the reality of the situation as um, Mr Justice Briggs had done, um, as he then was, uh, in the real world. And he said, if I make no award under this head of claim, the claimant will have a substantial debt that she could only uh, pay out of other lump sum awards I have made. There may be very little left in the light of the fact that I have only awarded a life interest in her accommodation. And when assessing what would amount to reasonable financial provision for her maintenance, I felt she was entitled to have her accommodation needs met and for her to be placed in a situation where she could manage afterwards an independent yet modest lifestyle. So if no award at all is made, this overall aim is placed in jeopardy. Now, in that decision, it appears um, His Honour Judge Gosnell was not referred to Ree Clark, so it may have been that that decision was made per incurium. But the decision in Bullock was then relied upon by Mr Justice Cohen in Ree H, a decision from May of this year. Mr Justice Cohen considered both Ree and Clark and Bullock um, and found that it was appropriate to consider the success fee liability as part of the claimant's needs, although he stated that he did so largely for case-specific reasons. Um, those included that he was not making a large award, unlike in Ree Clark, um, and if he did not make such an allowance, one or more of the claimant's primary needs would not be met. 
This does, however, leave us with two High Court authorities pointing in different directions, such that clarity is needed with a more thorough analysis of the interplay between Section 31A of the 1975 Act, and potentially Section 35, and Section 58A of the Courts and Legal Services Act. But for my part, the approach in the two most recent cases seems eminently sensible, where there is a risk that not taking into account a reasonable success fee, and I do say a reasonable success fee liability will lead to one or more of the claimant's primary needs not being met. Otherwise, it seems that the raise and detra for the 1975 Act, claim, uh, the 1975 Act, is completely undermined. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. And with an eye on the time, I shall hand on now to Helen Galley, who's going to say a little bit about execution of wills in the COVID age. As my former pupil supervisor, uh, Helen taught me everything I know um, pretty much about um, trust and estates. Um, and she's done a good job at trying to teach lots of litigants things they ought to know uh, in the context of her burgeoning mediation practice as well. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon a little bit and, and, and very quickly, I hope, on execution of wills in the time of COVID. I think it's a, typ a topical subject, but we'll just have to go back to basics first of all. We know that um, by reason of the Wills Act 1837, as amended by the Administration of Justice Act 1982, uh, nine, Section 9 of the Wills Act provides a that um, the will will not be valid unless it's in writing, signed by the testator or some other person in his presence or by his direction. B, it appears that the testator intended by a signature to give effect to the will. And C, the signature is made or acknowledged by the testator in the presence of two witnesses present at the same time, and each witness either attests or signs the will or acknowledges his signature in the presence of the testator, but not necessarily in the presence of any other witness. Now, the, the COVID pandemic has obviously uh, concentrated people's minds on the need perhaps to put their uh, affairs in order. Uh, but uh, during lockdown, it became very difficult for people to mix with other people outside their household and most probably people within their household would be the people that they would want to benefit from their will. So if they were making a will, they couldn't get those people to, to, to witness it because, it, as we all know, if a beneficiary um, witnesses a will, they forfeit any benefit under that will. Individuals in care homes or in hospital were not able to receive visitors, and so it became incredibly difficult for them to execute a will. Not only to execute a will, in fact, but to give instructions for a will in a way uh, which uh, the professional, and hopefully a professional in these circumstances, could be sure that those were the instructions actually of the person wishing to make the will, um, that they were doing so without any undue influence, and um, that the draft which they subsequently produced reflected the prospective testator's intentions. Now, there's some things which the, uh, the legislation can't deal with. You can't deal with uh, the way in which you take instructions, for example. But one area where the, which did receive statutory consideration was the question of execution. And early on in the pandemic, the potential problems of ensuring valid uh, execution uh, was appreciated by the government. And it indicated that it would amend the provisions of Section 9 on a temporary basis with effect from the 31st of January 2020. Now this it did by way of a statutory instrument under the Electronic Communications Act 2000, which was laid before Parliament on the 7th of September of this year and came into effect 21 days later on the 28th of September. So it is retrospective. It is retrospective to the 31st of January 2020. And it, what it did was to add a new subsection 2 to section 9, which provides for the purposes of, of paragraphs C and D of subsection of what is now subsection one of section nine um, in relation to wills made after the 31st of January and on or before the 31st of January 2022, presence includes presence by means of a video conference or other visual transmission. Now that end date of the 31st of January 2022 could be extended or abridged um, and even though the definition of presence has been temporarily changed, it's still necessary for each witness 
to sign and attest in the presence, albeit virtually, of the testator. The Ministry of Justice has also recommended that a particular statement is incorporated in the will, which states, I, name of testator, wish to make a will of my own free will and sign it here before these witnesses who are witnessing me doing this remotely. So that demonstrates that the will is one which has been executed remotely. The two witnesses are still required to witness the um, testator signing the will, so they must all be on the same Zoom call or, or whatever video plat um, conferencing platform you use. And the second point is that you can't use electronic signatures. There must be three wet signatures, albeit there may be a period of time between the signature of the testator being applied and the signatures of the witnesses. So how it works is that the testator has the draft will in front of them. They sign it in the presence virtually of the two witnesses. It is then sent to one of the witnesses who has another call and signs it. Um, and attest the signature of the testator and then it goes to the other witnesses. There may be some period of time between uh, that, that happening and of course it's very important that it's as short a time as possible, particularly if somebody is ill with Covid or ill in any other way or is elderly or frail because you may end up with a will which is not validly executed. So the changes are retrospective and the will and will validate wills which have been executed remotely before the 28th of September. So it's possible that some wills executed using video conferencing before that date, before the 28th of September, before the detailed provisions were known, um, will not have been executed properly even under the new rules. And so in those circumstances, it's very important that a new will is executed properly as soon as possible. The new definition of presence only applies to witnessing and not to uh, section, uh, subsection A of, the, uh, of, the, of uh, section 9, so not to the execution of the will by someone other than the testator pursuant to section 9, uh, that is 9.1a, um, because that provision deals with the situation where a testator is unable to sign for himself and it is still necessary for the third party who is to sign on behalf of the testator to be physically present with the testator when the will is signed because the possibility for fraud if the will has never in fact been in the physical presence of the testator is, is obvious. Now from a, 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 lit, um, a litigator's point of view there are some important points which arise from Article 3 of the 2020 order. <clears throat> this provides that the new definition of presence will not affect any grant of probate made or anything done pursuant to a grant of probate before the order came into force. Now this means that if um, a testator has died uh, sometime before the 28th of September, probably quite a bit before the 28th of September, and um, there was a previous traditionally executed will and a grant of probate has been made in relation to that will whenever that was executed. That grant will not be invalidated by the discovery of an electronically witnessed will which postdates the traditionally executed will. That does not apply to the situation where a grant of letters of administration have been issued but an electronically executed will is found. So if before the 28th of September, the testator has died, presumed to be intested, and a grant of letters of administration have been found, has been issued, but subsequently an electronically executed will is found, then that grant of letters of administration can be overturned. Now clearly, the reason for that is that, um, although that is actually not set out in the order itself, but is in the explanatory note, the intention of this is to, to ensure that effect is given to at least a version of the testator's expressed intentions. So it's better that um, there be some 
expressed intentions of the, of the testator, which is given effect to, than that they die intestate. However, that doesn't uh, necessarily, the, the, in, in, in the case of a grant of probate um, of an earlier traditionally executed will, that doesn't reflect the testator's intentions at the date it was executed, uh, it, at the date of death, because there is a, we know there is a later electronically executed will. But that doesn't seem to matter. Um, the earlier will, if there is a grant of probate related to that will, will take effect. But one of the problems which arises, of course, is that it would be perfectly possible, for example, say a child of the deceased knows that he takes a 50% interest in the estate of that deceased under an earlier uh, conventionally executed will, uh, but knows that they've been cut out under an electronically executed will. They could ignore the later will, apply for a grant of probate based on the earlier one, and at least based on the order, they would not be able to set that grant aside. It would not be possible to set that grant aside. However, of course, there may be grounds, other grounds on the basis of fraud and uh, deliberate concealment or something of that, that sort uh, to set the uh, earlier grant aside. But Article 3 doesn't take account of the fact that letters of administration are not only issued in cases of intestacy. There will be a grant of letters of administration with will and X, for example, if um, a testator has died, leaving a will where no executors are appointed or where the executors have died since the will was executed or the executors don't wish to take out a grant. So the result of this is that there is a, a, a conflict because in that situation, um, where there is a grant of letters of administration with will annexed, but there is a later um, electronically executed will, that grant can be set aside. Whereas the, in the case of a traditionally executed will where there is a grant of probate because executors have been appointed, uh, that grant cannot be set aside under the terms of the order. Um, the identity of witnesses is still important. And um, I, I did mention at the beginning the fact that you can't have uh, a beneficiary um, executing a will if you want that gift to the beneficiary to stand up. There is some internet discussion about the possibility of getting beneficiaries to, ex to witness the will and then executing a codicil confirming the provisions in the will and uh, with uh, independent witnesses. Now, I don't think that that is satisfactory because it runs the risk that the testator will have died before executing the codicil uh, with the result that the effect is not going to be given to the testator's intentions. Not all testators will have the ability or a desire to deal with execution remotely. Um, if you have, for example, a person who is in a care home um, and they may be very elderly but still having test of entry capacity, there may be no Wi-Fi, there may be no inter other internet link, that uh, testator may have no technological ability and the carers may not have any technological ability, there may be no appropriate computer or other device and it surely isn't going to be very satisfactory to deal with this on um, an iPhone. Um, there will be the testator may have no physical ability to take part in a video conferencing conference. So what can be done in those circumstances? If the testator is in a care home where no visitors are allowed or in a hospital where no visitors are allowed? Well, instructions for the will can be given over the telephone with a very careful note being made and questions asked to ascertain as far as possible capacity and the absence of due, uh, undue influence. And obviously professionals should be very aware of the risk of written instructions from a beneficiary or a family member in a letter that they send to the solicitor. The draft will can be sent to the testator by post, but how are you going to get it executed? 
well, the care home staff, or the hospital staff, may be prepared to witness the testator's signature, but we all know that quite often they're not prepared to do that. So in that event, the best that possibly probably can be done is for the witnesses to be the other side of a window and for there to be oral communication with the testator by phone or through an open window. Uh, both witnesses must be able to see the testator sign. And if the professional witnesses, and hopefully they will be professional witnesses in those circumstances, because the prospect I can see of litigation about capacity where somebody is in a care home or in hospital and uh, the witnesses have been outside the window and where uh, a professional has not executed, uh, has, has not, um, have not been present and witnessed the will, are huge. So the will can be passed outside to the witnesses after the testator is executed and they can then witness the signature. There are all sorts of issues about using separate pens and all this and social distancing, but um, those can be easily overcome. And the fact that you can execute through, uh, can um, validly witness a will that you've seen executed through a window uh, is uh, clear from the case of Casson and Cade in, uh, and Dade in 1781, which involved a maid who was in a carriage and who witnessed a will when the horse reared up, giving her a line of sight through a window. And that was held to be valid. And that was confirmed um, by, uh, as good law by Senior Judge Lush, Henry Clark in 2011, when he found that a lasting power of attorney had been validly executed where the donor was in one room and the witnesses in another separated by a glass door. The important thing is that the witnesses must actually see the testator sign the will. And that applies also to remote execution where the, the quality of the video, in conference, video conferencing must be adequate to enable both of the witnesses to see clearly. I have produced a paper on this and I'm going to get it put on the website because I am um, aware of the fact that I've rather rattled through it. But I do want to give you time to listen to the panel discussion, which I'm sure which will, will be more interesting than um, other talks that you've heard possibly this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. There were two questions for you, which whilst we are doing the panel discussion, um, you might, uh, if you're feeling very technologically savvy, um, decide to answer using the Q&A function. Um, I'd now like to introduce, but I should do it briefly because we are keen to ensure we don't keep you unduly on this webcast, um, my fellow panellists for the final session. First of all, I'm joined by Sarah Bayliss. Then I'm joined by Tom Stewart Coates. And I'm also joined last, but certainly not least, by James Fenimore. What we thought we'd do in this session, just to try and uh, make it uh, as lively an end to this afternoon's events as possible, is to talk about three particular issues which we have seen in the last 12 months or so cropping up on a particularly frequent basis. Those are, in order, Larkin Nugas requests and spats arising from um, those. Um, issues relating to uh, parties to ongoing proceedings who lack capacity or may lose capacity during the course of proceedings and some interesting issues uh, arising in relation to that. And then finally, and this is perhaps inevitable with the pandemic, delay in the administration of estates. Um, so taking the first of those first, uh, as is logical and sensible, Larkin Nugas requests, uh, in many respects, these are seen as being um, entirely straightforward and entirely unobjectionable. Uh, but I am fascinated by the limited extent to which an awful lot of people seem to really grasp what Larkin Nugas decided as a case um, and actually what the real juridical underpinnings are for these requests that we will deal with on a, on a weekly, if not a daily basis. So, um, James, is it right that actually Larkin Nugas requests are a pretty um, straightforward and unobjectionable area of practice? Well, no. So, although it's assumed some sort of totemic significance um, in probate practice, Larkin Nugas is actually an awful lot narrower um, than we've come to think of it. It's a case, uh, it's called appeal case from 1979. Um, but although Lord Justice Brandon was writing his judgment at the same time that Lord Mountbatten was apparently writing an anguish letter to the Prince of Wales, the decision wasn't actually reported in the wills and trust law reports until the year 2000. 
Um, it was about the estate of Elsie Moss, um, who made a will in May 1973 and died in July, but left her house, which was her only substantial asset, to a married couple who'd been engaged to look after her only since March. Henrietta Nugas, her cousin, was a bit suspicious about this, so she very sensibly um, wrote a letter to Elsie's executors, um, one of whom was, importantly, the solicitor who had drafted the will for Elsie, um, and she asked for a copy of the will and a statement of evidence regarding the execution of the will and the surrounding circumstances. Um, less sensibly, when uh, the executors sought pronouncement of the will in solemn form, having not given um, Henrietta that information, uh, Henrietta opposed, uh, raising both undue influence and want of knowledge and approval, but eventually withdrew both allegations prior to the trial. Um, the argument was all actually all about costs. So Mr Justice Brown Wilkinson made no order as to costs because he thought that Nugas should have to pay the costs of the undue influence plea because it had no foundation, but that the estate should have to pay the costs of the knowledge and approval plea because there were suspicious circumstances that hadn't been dispelled with an appropriate response to Henrietta's letters. So that was appealed, and in the Court of Appeal, whilst Lord Justice Brandon quoted from the then Law Society guidance, which stated that solicitors should make available a statement of his evidence regarding the execution of the will, that wasn't actually the point on which he decided the case. And he didn't interrogate that as guidance, and he didn't approve of it as guidance either. What he instead said was, in my judgment, the principle which applied is that when there's litigation about a will, every effort should be made by the executors to avoid costly litigation if that can be avoided. And when there are circumstances of suspicion attending to the execution and making of a will, one of the measures which can be taken is to give full and frank information to those who might have an interest in attacking the will. So the ratio of Lark and Nugas is simply that executors should make reasonable efforts to avoid costly litigation or they will not receive their costs. And that might involve providing full information where there are suspicious circumstances surrounding the creation of the will. But what Lark and Nugas doesn't talk about is what happens when the solicitor is not the executor um, or where there are not suspicious circumstances surrounding the making of the will. Um, so the problem that a solicitor is confronted with if, if they receive a Lark and Nugas letter and are not named as the executor is how um, to align what many people now think is the ratio of Lark and Nugas with the principal um, considerations of confidentiality and privilege which survive the former client's death. Um, the 2011 SRA Code of Conduct stated that disclosing the consent of a will on the death of a client without consent first being provided by the PR was indicative behaviour that the solicitor had not complied with the SRA principles. Um, so, Ed, I wonder if you think that the current Law Society guidance has actually cleared all of this up for us? Oh, you know full well that I, I don't, James. I think, with no disrespect to anyone um, sitting anonymously behind a computer here who may be involved in that process, I think it leaves a little bit to be desired. But um, I caveat that because actually it's quite difficult to work out what the true juridical underpinnings are of an obligation on a firm that's been drafting a will to provide material to people who have a potential claim. Um, the Law Society guidance, as it stands um, at the moment, having been revamped recently, quite rightly acknowledges the legal position is not yet clear. Uh, and that sits fairly uncomfortably with, as James has already indicated, the um, uh, indicative behaviour that's cited in the SRA code for a failure to comply with obligations. So th that leaves the position really very unclear. And um, I think that a lot of care is required on behalf of a solicitor who receives a Larkin Nugas request to check, for example, that privileged or confidential materials not being willy nilly handed over to um, a third party who's not entitled to it. Um, and um, we could go into quite a lot of detail about the ins and outs of that, but I am conscious of making sure we, we stick to time. W one other point, just keeping with the theme of disputes I've seen a lot of um, recently, is the question of who bears the cost of producing um, a copy, for example, of a will file, or a potentially very lengthy and detailed Larkin Nugas um, request response. James, if you've got one, um, would you seek to charge the party requesting for your time and your photocopying? <laughs> 
and well, I, I probably would. This is another area where the Law Society guidance slightly chickens out and just says it's for you to decide in the circumstances whether it's appropriate. But I think it's appropriate to charge for the time that you spent working on things. So, yes, I think it's, wor it's worth a punt. Well, I might uh, be tempted to play devil's advocate in relation to that, but I'll leave everyone at home um, to try and think through the arguments and counter proposals a little in their head. Um, t turning on then to the second theme that we were going to talk about, which is capacity. Um, Sarah and I are doing a case at the moment where we have um, potential capacity issues, where we've got um, an elderly client who's not in the hay list of health, um, has um, occasional visits to hospital. And when he does, of course, he has all sorts of treatments. And that means there may be fluctuating capacity. Um, uh, Tom, though, whilst the position might be fairly well settled in England about the need for a litigation friend, what if you're not appearing in proceedings in um, the English High Court, say, and you're suddenly faced with circumstances where your client or a client on, for the other side um, might not have capacity? Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, with, with two eyes on the time, I'll, I'll be very brief indeed. But I do think this is um, a very interesting topic of which there is um, there seems to be an absolute dearth of authority, at least in the public domain. So if you do want to hear more, please do let me know offline. Um, so I was involved in a case, um, a family trust dispute before a specialist international commercial court, um, whose court rules and empowering statute contained uh, no provisions dealing with incapacity. So um, not unlike a situation one might see in, in an arbitration, for example. Um, one of the litigants in our case was also not in the hay list of health. He was a 98-year-old man, and there were concerns among the other side of the litigation, being two of his children, about his capacity to litigate and to take various steps um, in relation to the family's business interests. So the question arose in this context, um, and I think it, it, it will feature in, in, in various um, offshore courts and before arbitration tribunals, is, is how the court should deal with the potential incapacity of one of the parties before it, lacking as it did um, the express powers and duties that an English judge would have. Um, so I suggest that the court or tribunal has broadly three options. First, um, the tribunal could simply ignore the issue of capacity and press on uh, to make a substantive determination of the dispute. Um, second, uh, the tribunal could stay the proceedings before it and allow the parties to have the issue of capacity determined elsewhere, uh, perhaps in the courts of the person's domicile or habitual residence or, or in the courts uh, with supervisory jurisdiction over the arbitration, if, if it's an arbitration. Um, third, the tribunal could decide the issue of capacity itself and take whatever protective measures are available to it to ensure the fairness and integrity of the proceedings. Um, I would tentatively suggest that as a matter of principle, it must be right that a tribunal should have the power to decide whether a litigant before it has capacity to litigate and that the powers to protect that litigant's interest should be part of any tribunal's toolkit uh, to ensure the fairness and integrity of proceedings before it. Um, uh, the alternatives are really quite unsatisfactory. Uh, either the issue is ignored uh, with the undesirable result, not only that a huge unfairness uh, might be visited on the litigant lack in capacity, uh, but any ensuing award or judgment rendered in such circumstances um, may not be enforceable in some or all other jurisdictions. And that would, of course, uh, be an undesirable result for all parties, even if they have um, an immediate tactical advantage. Uh, the second alternative, staying the arbitration and allowing the issue to determine some other forum, uh, also has uh, various undesirable features. First, it would almost inevitably increase costs and time. Uh, second, uh, there would usually be a question mark over the appropriate alternative forum for the capacity issue to be decided in. Uh, and third, if capacity is to be determined uh, functionally, um, which does seem to be the um, prevailing uh, approach across uh, at least the common law world, uh, the tribunal is in as good position as anybody to decide whether the litigant understands and can give instructions in relation to those proceedings. Um, and, and, and finally, um, if the litigant lacking capacity doesn't want to force a determination elsewhere and the other party to the arbitration cannot or will not do so, does the issue then get ignored uh, and um, or prevent any substantive determination of the arbitration? So I, I'd suggest there, therefore, by way of brief conclusion, that there can only be one sensible answer to the question I posed earlier. The tribunal can and should get on and determine the issue of capacity to litigate itself, uh, notwithstanding a lack of any uh, clear express power uh, or jurisdiction to do so. Um, back to you, I think, Ed.
one of the issues that I've seen um, a reasonable amount in the last year is issues where either during the course of proceedings uh, uh, a party has lost capacity and actually it's quite difficult for solicitors to be monitoring non-stop whether their client has capacity or not um, and of course in that scenario there's the risk that the solicitor could be on the hook for the other party's um, legal costs. Now there's some interesting recent cases um, in the English court that suggest that the basis for that liability is some sort of implied warranty of authority and some sort of implied contract um, between the solicitors on one side and the ultimate party on the other side of litigation. Um, and as a result of that, it suggested there might be some need for a causal connection and, and, and um, things like that. I have to say, I think that analysis is somewhat inapt. Uh, and there's a fascinating pair of, of Court of Appeal decisions from the mid 1800s, where it seems pretty clear that that sort of analysis was not part of the court's reasoning. And yet with a case called Young and Toynbee, in my view, arguably all the cases have taken a slightly wrong turn. Um, and actually the better analysis is that the court just has an inherent jurisdiction to order an officer of the court to pay costs in circumstances where they've acted without authority. Um, I, I could go into a lots of detail about that now. It's probably an entire other talk on its own. But um, if anyone has a case in this area, it's, uh, it's an issue I'm particularly fascinated by. Um, so moving on to our final area for discussion, uh, and that is ironically in the very last part of the very last slot, the question of delay. Uh, in relation to the administration of estates. Obviously with COVID, there's many very good reasons why administration might not have been as quick as you might have liked. But Sarah, you've been, um, you've come across some quite interesting issues that can arise where things haven't happened as quickly as they ought to have done, haven't you? Uh, yes, Ed, uh, thanks for that. Well, um, the, the two aspects of delay I want to look at very briefly um, are uh, connected with 1975 Act claims uh, and um, claims for rectification under Section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act 1982. Um, as most people listening uh, will know, um, both of those uh, provisions uh, have their own flexible limitation periods. Um, claims brought more than six months after probate in both cases uh, can only be brought with the permission of the court. Um, and there are, as a corollary to that, there are um, savings in Section 20 of the 1975 Act uh, and um, uh, sec uh, Section 20 uh, sub 3 uh, of the Administration of Justice Act to the effect that PRs uh, aren't to be made liable for distributions made after that six month period has passed purely by reasons of claims being brought out of time. So I just want to say something um, very briefly about how the court exercises its, its discretion um, in those sorts of cases. Uh, and again, very well trodden territory uh, for um, uh, our, the panel and uh, most of the audience will be the guidelines in Berger and Berger, which set out, um, or Berger and Berger indeed, um, a non-exclusive list of factors that are to be taken into account. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'm going to assume that you know what those are, um, but uh, even if you didn't, uh, you could readily make them up uh, in circumstances where the job um, uh, of the court is to take account of all the circumstances of the case. Um, it's not an exhaustive list uh, in any event. Uh, and as uh, Lord Justice Floyd remarked in the recent case of Begum and Ahmed, um, Section 4 has been up to the Court of Appeal um, three or four times over the last year or so. Um, he said, as with any such list, there's a danger if it's taken as a template that other important factors relevant to the exercise uh, of the discretion uh, will be overlooked. Um, speaking of overlooking things, in a thoroughly bad day at the office, uh, Mr Justice Mostyn uh, in Cowan and Foreman uh, in the uh, heady days of the summer of 2019 came to the following um, conclusions about the application of uh, Section 4, as uh, some of our audience uh, it, it will, will be uh, more viscerally aware um, than others. He said, respondents shouldn't be troubled by stale claims. 
Uh, a robust application of the power in section four would be in line with the overriding objective and the developing jurisprudence in sanctions cases. It wasn't an unfettered discretion at all, since the Berger guidelines constituted a number of highly prescriptive fettering factors, and it all came down to whether there was, there was one, good reasons for the delay, and two, uh, a claim of sufficient merit. Um, uh, in very measured terms, the Court of Appeal said no to that. Um, Lady Justice Asplin said, the point of section four was to avoid tardy claims, holding up administration or complications which might arise if distributions had already been made before a claim was made. This was a statutory provision and so the provisions of the CPR and jurisprudence on uh, sanctions were entirely irrelevant. Um, it, there was no disciplinary aspect to section four and it wasn't to be enforced just for the sake of it, so there. Um, and the correct approach was to consider all the burger factors and any other relevant factors and give them appropriate weight. Um, that was, um, well, read the case, it's quite good fun. Some of you will already have done so, uh, but there was, uh, there, there was quite a lot of pushback from, from the Court of Appeal in the way they dealt with things. A um, couple of final points. Um, the court stressed on a number of occasions that there's no time tariff, i.e. no cu cut-off point as to how long a delay might be considered uh, reasonable. Question again of balancing all the relevant factors. Uh, but I give you, if you haven't run across it, the recent case of Bissati, um, uh, on the exceptional circumstances of that case. And Are you telling that, Sarah, in case people haven't come across it? B H or H, as some people might say, U S A T E. Um, uh, that, that's a cracking case if you ever want to uh, have an application a long time out of time, uh, because in that case, uh, uh, the application was granted 25 years and nine months out of time uh, by Chief Master Marsh. Uh, and that decision was upheld by Edwin Johnson QC. Uh, sitting as a judge of the High Court in January this year. Um, sadly, though, usually applications will be refused uh, if the delay has been more than six months, uh, unless there's a good reason. Um, a final, final point, picking up with uh, Alina's discussion earlier of Master Schumann's judgment in Kelly and Brennan, um, that was a case uh, for rectification under Section 20, of the Administration of Justice Act 1982, uh, and Master Schumann somewhat delphically decided uh, that the Berger Guidelines or Berger Guidelines should be applied, but said that she considered that Section 20 sub 2, jurisdiction to uh, extend time, was more flexible than it was in Section 4 cases. Um, if anybody can explain to me um, why that is really, I'd be delighted to hear uh, from them. Uh, one of the things she said was that the um, judgment in Marley and Rawlings uh, decided that the um, Section 20 jurisdiction was very flexible, uh, but that was about uh, what constituted um, uh, what what constituted um, uh, a um, administrative error uh, or, or uh, when it came to um, the criteria for um, allowing rectification. It had nothing to do with time periods. Um, I think it might simply be uh, that a court considering an application for extension of time uh, in a rectification case will be able to see perfectly well what the, what the merits of the substantive claim are. Uh, and that may enable that court uh, to give those factors uh, more weight uh, than could be given in a 1975 Act claim, um, although that isn't what Master Schumann uh, said. Uh, Ed, that's that's my six pennyworth, so, so back to you. Thank you very much, uh, and I think, folks, that's all we've got time for. A little bit of a whistle-stop tour, I know, through um, our hot topics of the last year or so, but each of them, I think, lends itself to um, a, a seminar on its own or a, maybe a roundtable discussion. So if anyone tuned in uh, would be interested in that, please do get in touch. We'd, we'd be very happy to, to talk to you directly about it.
Um, that just leaves me to say thank you very much to all of the speakers for the fantastic content we've had this afternoon. Uh, and also, most of all, a massive thank you to you for sitting in the office or most probably at home listening in. Hopefully we'll be able to meet up properly soon. Thank you all very much. Bye bye.